All right, why don't we go ahead and get started, if you guys could take your seats. <clears throat> uh, so what I'm talking about today is problems with Keynesian solutions of the current depression. And this is just to give you a flavor of where I'm going. This is a, a witch doctor. Um, <laughs> And it, it's not that I'm criticizing Keynesians with that, it's just we're showing how culturally sensitive we are here at the Mises Institute. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. is it, in all seriousness, you may remember M Mises in that one part in Human Action says it's not irrational to engage in a rain dance, it's using means to achieve ends, it's just you know, a very poor choice of means. Okay, so the same thing here. We're not saying these Keynesians are irrational in that sense. Okay. Um, so let me start out now. The problem with giving lectures here is that a lot of you are extremely advanced and you know you want to argue about what Rothbard said in footnote 14, that sort of thing. Whereas some of you, it's like, oh yeah, my professor told me to come here and I thought, you know, yeah, spending July down in Auburn sounds great. I hear the weather's fine down there at that time of year. So there, there is differences. So it's, I'm going to have to, a lot of you are going to know some of these things, but I think later in the, in the lecture, you'll, you'll get things, maybe nuances that you haven't heard before. And I will, as always, tell you I'm going to leave time at the end for questions, and then I probably won't. So uh, here, this is, the, partly why I want to walk through is, is I want to make sure a lot of bloggers and, and guys like Glenn Beck or whatever referred to this episode. And so I want to be crystal clear about what happened, particularly the way Krugman has, has dealt with this. So let me just walk you through and make sure you guys know exactly what's going on. So Christina Romer was the um, head of the Council of Economic Advisors. She, she was like Obama's chief economist, as it were, the incoming new Obama administration. And she was the lead author, you know, her name is on this thing, for the, the economic analysis that was undergirding what we now refer to as the Obama stimulus package, right? The, um, a A A R R A was you know in terms of the actual title of the legislation. So where they spent and the the numbers differ. Like the, at the time, I think they called they scored it at 787 billion, and then later on they gave a revised estimate and it was I think 800 billion and change. You know, but what's 50 billion among friends? And um, so that that's what I'm talking about. You know, you, you guys remember the Obama stimulus. And to be clear, that's not the same thing as TARP. Okay, a lot of times some people get those things mixed up. The Troubled Asset Relief Program was under the Bush administration, uh, you know, the free market guru who wanted to have the federal government own a bunch of financial stocks. That was the Bush administration. Uh, this we're talking about is the big stimulus plan uh, put in by the new Ob incoming Obama administration. So in order for them to justify this to the American people, they had this report and this uh, everything except the red comes from the actual Romer report. Okay, so the red stuff somebody else added on after the fact, but this was what they had in that report to explain to the American people why it makes sense for us to pass what at the time was touted as a $787 billion plan that consisted partly of tax cuts and partly of uh, expenditures. So that's where the $787 billion came from. So there were, you know, like, I'm making these numbers up like $450 billion of tax cuts, targeted tax cuts, and then the rest in terms of increased spending. So um, you, you can see here, they're saying, so that at the time, this was in remember, early 2009, so at that time, the official unemployment rate was 7% and change, and it was rising, right, because this is a few months after the crisis in September of 2008, everybody thought the world was collapsing. We got through that, thank goodness, because Ben Bernanke came in and created a trillion dollars. You know, phew. But um, thank goodness we were on the gold standard. But still, the economy is struggling, and they're warning us that you know there's not enough spending that's going to be happening, and so we need to uh, prime the pump, and so we want to have more demand, and so to get the American people, you know, because 787 billion dollars—that's a lot, even for the government to be borrowing and spending or to be cutting taxes and thus having a bigger deficit than would otherwise be the case. So that's a lot of extra federal debt to be racking up over the course of two years. Why is that justified? And so this is what they were saying. They were saying, okay, right now unemployment's around 7% and change, but it's, if we do nothing, it will keep going up, and heaven forbid, it might even just break 9% if we do nothing. And can you imagine how awful that would be? And I was like, that would be terrible. Unemployment of 9%, I can't, that'd be like in the early 80s, that's awful. They said, right, so why don't we go ahead and pass this thing because then unemployment won't break 8%. And 
you know, it'll go up. You know, we can't, we're not magicians, you know, we're scientists. We can't, <laughs> we're not promising miracles here, but we will mitigate it and things will turn around and then, you know, but it won't break 8%. But holy cow, the laissez-faire free market, if we just do a liquidationist thing and do nothing, it'll go, you know, it might even break 9%. That's, that's inconceivably awful. You know, we're not going to do that. Okay, so then, of course, they pass it, and then what happens, obviously, the actual unemployment rate broke 10%, all right? So, now, here, again, it, let's not um, be so eager to pounce on this that we forget our Austrian principles. This, by itself, doesn't prove that the stimulus package was a bad idea. This, doesn't, this demonstration here that I just went through doesn't prove that that extra spending made the economy worse, made un the unemployment rate higher than it otherwise would be, but what I want, but it's not certainly not good, right? It doesn't help their case. And so what you want, to, what I've been saying with to Keynesians, and of course, not just me, that other people, and not even just Austrians, but just general free market economists. Russ Roberts, if you know him, has been really good on this in his uh, podcast that he does, and having both Keynesians and anti-Keynesians on, and in, in his very soft-spoken, reasonable way, just making this point over and over that. Yeah, what, what would reality have to look like? What would the data have to look like for you Keynesians to realize there's a potential problem here? In other words, suppose you guys were totally wrong and the stimulus actually was poison. Isn't that what it would look like? And so it's fine for you guys to say, oh, no, other things weren't equal, but don't walk around saying, duh, you know, the evidence is on our side. How can you right-wingers be so blind to the empirical facts? That on the face of it, prima facie, this looks like you were wrong. Um, let me just point out in terms of a, again, this isn't even so much an Austrian thing, but just a general free market critique, why does this make sense? Because uh, for whatever reason that you think unemployment is going to go up, in other words, uh, there, there must be some explanation. If you're an economist, whatever, you're either a Keynesian, Austrian, a monetarist, what have you, supply sider, you have to have this theory of what causes recessions and why unemployment would ever be higher than a normal rate. Like why would ever, unemployment ever go up to 8% as opposed to markets just instantly clearing. So whatever your views are, uh, the point is if you're a free market kind of an economist, you're gonna think whatever that particular nuanced explanation is, probably you're not gonna mitigate those factors by having the government come in and take an extra $300 billion from the private sector and devote it to politically motivated ends, right? Whatever those, in other words, uh, in general, here's another way of putting it that I, I used to use a lot during when this was big. I used to say, look, if, if the economy were fine and all of a sudden this new administration came in and said, we're going to increase the deficit by $787 billion, people would be freaking out, right? That, that was a huge number at the time. Now it seems like nothing just because that happened, and then we just filed that away as part of history, and so now that number is not as big to us. And because Bernanke's been doing stuff that has T's in it, namely trillions, so we get desensitized. But at the time, that was a massive number. Just to give you some context, earlier, so this was, uh, I think, like around March of, I'll get my dates mixed up, I think March of 2008, I believe, or around there, George Bush proposed a tax cut to try to stimulate the economy. Maybe there was some spending, I don't remember. Uh, but it was, a, it, was a, it was his Bush stimulus package, and it, I think, was something like $300 billion or so. And the congressional Democrats were freaking out, saying, you can't be so irresponsible and run up the deficit that much, right? So uh, just to give you an idea of, of the magnitude. So this thing was much bigger than what, what Bush had been proposing. So uh, if things were normal, if the economy were fine, and someone came along and said, why don't we do that? the standard free market response would be, well, well, no, that's not helping anybody. That's going to make us poorer than we otherwise would be. It's going to redirect resources away from uh, private channels and into government-selected ends. And so clearly, if you believe that in the efficacy of markets and that decentralized prices help direct things better than government planners, that's going to make us poorer. That's bad. So why would that general presumption flip all of a sudden if you say, okay, but suppose the economy is already on the ropes and we're really in trouble of you know, an awful economy, maybe then would it be good to take resources from the private sector and have politicians direct them, right? So that, that general presumption wouldn't flip. And so you could see how whatever you think is causing the economy to be bad right now, doing this is gonna make it worse, all right? And of course, the Austrians would have a more particular story that Roger Garrison and others this week have talked to you about. So, uh, what was, so what's interesting then is how did the Keynesians deal with this 
they just took it in stride and said, whew, it's a good thing we acted when we did because the economy was a lot worse than we realized. That had we done nothing, you know, this line in retrospect, we shouldn't have drawn it like that. It should have been way up here. Unemployment could have been 13% if we had done nothing, right? So in other words, they just know that federal spending, other things equal, raises demand and creates more jobs. And the only possible issue would be the composition of the output and that um, eventually if you hit full employment, full output, if, if a real output equaled potential output, then additional spending would just raise prices. You know, that's the, in the standard Keynesian model. That's what eventually would happen. So if you try to use a uh, reductio ad absurdum on them and say, well, gee, if spending an extra two trillion is good, why don't we spend an extra 50 trillion? They would have a reply to that. They would say, well, because once you hit full employment, further spending just causes prices to go up because you can't you know, literally create more output out of a given stock of resources. So that, that's what they would say. Uh, but again, there's their whole theoretical framework, their whole modeling assumption presumes that if you do have a gap in potential output or a gap between potential and, and actual output and you have idle resources, in their mind, you got a bunch of workers sitting around watching the prices right in their apartment, there is no opportunity cost to do some policy change that gets them off their butts into a factory and making stuff, right? It's not that something else has to go down in order for their output to go up because by definition we're dealing with idle resources. So that's, that's their, their mindset. And so when you see these studies that came out after the fact, um, like in 2010 and 2011, that were, you know, people would say stuff like bloggers and things would refer to these studies and say, um, oh, according to the uh, the Census Bureau or according to the, you know, these uh, allegedly reputable organizations, they did a study and they found that this uh, Obama stimulus package saved or created 2.37 million jobs, right? And they would or the, and they'd give a range too to make it look real accurate, you know, with a probability distribution, because again, we're scientists. And, and, but when you go, went and looked at it, it's not that they did some ex post, you know, investigation, like say, okay, originally we had our theory then we did it, and now let's look at the results and then use a different methodology. No, they just use the same modeling approach and maybe tweak some of the numbers you know, to, to update the fact that they knew now how much they actually spent, whereas in two, 2009, they were projecting how much would we spend by quarter. Okay, but in other words, the model had it built into it that other things equal, if you spend more, you create jobs. All right, so it's not that they were testing the Keynesian theory, that there was, there was nothing the numbers could have done to make them conclude, ooh, we actually destroy jobs. That would have been an impossible result given the way those things were designed. Okay, let me talk a little bit about how Krugman himself deals with this episode that's a little bit embarrassing from the Keynesian perspective. Uh, so he's a very clever guy and he did a brilliant job. It, it is true. From the beginning, and he said this before he knew what the answer was going to be, from the beginning it is true that he was warning when the Roma report came out on his blog within days of that thing going public, you know, this is in January of 2009, it is true, you go look this up at his blog, and he was saying that Democrats don't do this, this is, I'm telling you, this could blow up in your face, that unemployment two years from now is still going to be unacceptably high and I guarantee you these re Republicans are gonna say, hey, we tried stimulus and it didn't work, and it's gonna discredit Keynesianism, so I'm warning you, that's gonna happen. This is inadequate, you should spend more. All right? so it's true he did say that. However, um, it's, it's not true that Krugman, let me just back up for a second. It's not true that Krugman was saying this line that you were drawing here actually should be way up here. And that's why un actual unemployment with the stimulus is going to be bigger. No, what Krugman was saying, if you go and read him carefully, he was saying, what are you guys talking about? Like here in late 2010, unemployment is still going to be 7.5% with the recovery plan. That's too high. People are still going to be mad that 18 months into this thing, unemployment is still 7.5%. So what are you guys doing? Why aren't you more aggressive? Why don't you spend more and make this thing, you know, kick over faster to get the number down to reasonable territory sooner because you don't want Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh being able to harp on that. Okay, so do you understand the important distinction there? So yes, Krugman was warning them this is inadequate, but it wasn't because he realized 
that the economy is worse than you guys think it is, it's because he was saying even on your own terms. Now even there, let me just, full disclosure, he actually was saying he also thought this was optimistic. But reading him, it's like you think he's saying, okay, it might be like in here or something. It's not that he was saying it's gonna be way up there. All right, so th that's, that's the point. And um, I don't wanna shock you, but now after the fact, Krugman would lead you to believe that he knew it was gonna be up here, right? So he's uh, being a little bit overly generous with his predictive powers. And again, I hope I didn't shock anyone by saying that. Okay, so that's, that's the point I just made here, that when he says that he warned about that, his, he's actually using, and, and he was doing it rhetorically. So his point was he was trying to say to the Keynesians, I'm not being a stick in the mud. I'm agreeing with the conventional multipliers and the forecasts and everything. All I'm saying is, look at, you, look at these Romer's own figures. Why are we getting all excited about that? And the people at the time were telling him, yeah, Paul, we know what you're saying, but politically we can't ask for a, a, a deficit, you know, a, a stimulus package that's above a trillion dollars. That's going to freak people out. We can't do that politically. And so, and there's reports that like behind closed doors, Romer herself was actually pushing for a bigger stimulus. And then somebody, I think Larry Summers maybe, um, you know, was saying, we, we can't do that politically. It's got to be less than a trillion. So just, just because that sounds like too much money to be asking for. Okay, uh, another thing too, so some people are just trying to say, okay, so Christina Romer is not a good forecaster, but Keynesianism still works. And it wasn't just Romer. It was like guys like Mark Zandi also um, in November of 2008 came out with a, a, a forecast or whatever, a big study assessing the state of the U.S. economy, looking at the trends, saying if we do nothing, this is what spending is going to do. Therefore, we need a stimulus of such and such size. And again, the same pattern, for some reason, magically, the economy, as the Keynesians saw it before the stimulus passed, was unhealthy but not terrible. And then after the stimulus passed, wow, the economy just got a lot worse for some reason. All right, and again, that's if you thought the stimulus would hurt, that's consistent with that. And also notice too, the more rational you think people are, when, when would that pain set in? It would be right after the thing passed and it became law. All right, so in other words, if you're, if you're told, oh, by the way, your taxes are gonna go up, or you know, if somebody tells you we're gonna shoot you next month, it's not that you're fine until next month. You know what I mean? You're gonna adapt right now. You're gonna for that awful thing that's coming. So the same thing, it's not a coincidence. In other words, it's consistent with the critique of the stimulus to say the bad stuff really started happening uh, up front even before the things that would come later on, even before the bulk of the spending kicked in. In other words, that it would be the knowledge of the policy change that would make private uh, entrepreneurs you know, cut back investment if they think, oh man, my taxes are gonna be higher in the future now because to pay for this stimulus, you would start dealing with that right away. You wouldn't wait for the tax bill to go up before you adjust it. Okay, um, in general, the Keynesians, because what's happened? Clearly, we have been following Keynesian policies in the US and in many other countries since 2008. And so what's their, and clearly things haven't been great since 2008. Nobody is gonna beam with pride about the successful recovery that these policies have instituted or, or that have been associated with. So what's the standard Keynesian response, of course, is to say, well, you didn't really try it. You didn't really give it the old college effort. You didn't do what John Maynard Keynes would have said. You didn't do what Paul Krugman would have said. So it's been, oh, it's too little, too late. So I, what would you have to do to try to defeat that. And again, you can never prove that, right? In economics, there's no such thing as a controlled experiment. There's no way we could ever have an open and shut, well, they said to do this, we did it, such and such was the result, therefore they were wrong, because again, it's all things are always counterfactuals, right? And again, th th this is an Austrian point. So we, we can't get too mad at the Keynesians in any particular case for raising this objection, but without looking at the, at the numbers first, and we just say, okay, but how, how would we referee as an outsider? Sure, we know that you can never really prove it per se, but what would things look like to make you side with one side versus the other? And probably if you had like historically unprecedented increase in monetary intervention and that didn't work, that would be good prima facie evidence that such intervention wasn't a good idea and that, oh, if we just had done a little bit more. Right, so when you look at Federal Reserve policy, it seems odd to me to say, 
Yeah, the problem is Bernanke just didn't do enough. You see what I'm saying? Like he has more than tripled the monetary base since 2008. So if what you think is that really we just need a little bit more monetary stimulus and too bad Bernanke is such a tight wad, that graph is a little bit awkward. Again, it's possible maybe if, if he had just gone up to here, we'd have 2% unemployment right now. That's possible. I can't prove the opposite, but the point is this by itself is a little bit awkward if you're saying the problem since 2008 is that Ron Paul has been scaring Bernanke. And, that, and I, I'm not even, you might, some of you might think I'm joking. No, they literally are saying that. People are blaming this on Ron Paul because he has intimidated Ben Bernanke. <laughs> and I mean, he, he probably has, does intimidate him in the sense that like, gee, I don't want to go to that hearing tomorrow. You know, I, I get that, but I don't think that you can look at Federal Reserve policy and, and see that, yeah, you could see how Ron Paul's fingerprints are all over that. <laughs> okay, same thing with the federal surplus or deficit. So here I'm loading the deck by doing it in absolute terms, but again, it's, it's fun to load the deck and the next slide will be a little bit fairer to the Keynesians. Same story here, what, what are they saying? They're saying, yeah, they did engage in some deficit spending in response to this crisis when Ron Paul and the other Austrians would have said not to do that, but come on, given the magnitude of this gap between actual output and potential output, they should have, done a much, they should have had a much bigger deficit so you, you, you can't prove that, right? The only way we could literally prove it is to turn back time and have a $2 trillion deficit or a $3 trillion deficit and then see what would have happened because we don't know what the counterfactual baseline is to compare it with. But again, given what we have to work with, that all we know is what they did in, in the real world and what the actual result was, what would count as a strike against their theory? Well, what if you had the biggest deficit ever in US history and that didn't work and you just say we needed a little bit more that would be kind of awkward, and that's what, that's what did happen, right? So now let's do that as a percentage of GDP to make it a little fair. So this is federal debt held by the public, according to CPO. So you can see here, federal debt went up in just from 2007, 2008 up here, and it got up to levels that it hasn't been in over 60 years, and that was when it was coming down from World War II, which was with the, with the, with the highest in, U, in U.S. history, right? So, um, I, again, doesn't prove anything, but what would the graph have to look like for us to be able to say that, come on, this is a slam dunk case, clearly monetary intervention and the federal government's borrowing and spending money is not the solution. We tried that and it didn't work. Wouldn't it look like that? Incidentally, also, uh, well, I just had this slide up here. What these things mean, in case you, you see these numbers bandied about a lot, the, the CBO's baseline projection is saying if the way things are currently written the law take effect and legislators don't change them, this is the projection. So what it's saying is the government predicts that it's going to get real responsible pretty soon. And then and it will stay responsible. And this alternative fiscal scenario is the CBO saying, Suppose legislators act like legislators have historically acted, what would things look like? And you see how it goes up. And it's, um, it, in case you're wondering, look at the particulars, it's things like the, what's called the Medicare doc fix. So like, they always have programmed in that they're going to greatly uh, claw back how much they reimburse doctors who have Medicare patients for various treatments and things. But then they never actually do it because nobody wants to be voting to cut reimbursements to doctors, especially if they're getting less than uh, you know, what, what they think they would need to in terms of their costs and medical malpractice and so on, because then they might just drop a bunch of clients who can't pay cash or who don't have private insurance. So things like that. Also, the so-called Bush tax cuts, that that's scheduled to expire. So there's like a built-in huge tax increase. And so that's partly why this goes down, because they're saying, oh, we're going to get all this more revenue. And this is saying, well, but what if they extend it like they keep doing because nobody wants to be voting for a huge tax hike in the midst of an awful recession? So that's, that's where these, these discrepancies come in from. Okay, uh, what about the success story of World War II? So here, again, the, the Keynesian trump card is to say, we have a clear-cut example of where our policies worked, so we're not stretching things. It's not ludicrous for us to say, why don't we just do now what we have seen historically worked in the past. Uh, I, I don't want to re repeat too much of what I said because a lot of you guys saw my talk 
on this uh, yesterday where I covered some of these points. So let me just cover some different aspects of the same story, a little bit of repetition. Uh, one thing, let me, I do want to, I mean, obviously I'm trying to make jokes and, and make fun of them a little bit, but let me make sure you do understand that what the Keynesian, uh, why Keynesians like this so much, right? Because the problem in general when you ask what's the, the so-called multiplier on government spending and you're trying to assess empirically what is the effectiveness of the government coming along and spending more money to try to fix the economy? How can we test whether that works or not? Not using our models, our, our theoretical models, but to try to just be neutral and let the facts speak for themselves. The problem with doing that is you have, uh, you, you confuse correlation and causation. Right? I mean, there's the sophisticated terms you would use in econometrics for this, but I'm trying to just give, to give it to you in plain English. So it's, uh, let me give you an analogy first to so make sure you get the, the concept. What if somebody says, you know, oh, I don't believe in hospitals. You say, what are you talking about, believe in hospitals? You know, that, there's a bunch of uh, witch doctors in there, and you just, I don't go to hospitals. I, you know, I have a tumor, but I'm going to handle it myself. You know, just, just give me that can opener, right? What if someone's talking like that? And then you say, what are you talking about? That's crazy. And they, they say, no, I can prove it empirically. Look at, you know, what the death rate among the normal population, and look at the death rate in hospitals, and you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Right? Or another thing is somebody could say, you know, I don't believe in, uh, well, I was going to say, a standard one to use is, is police and crime, but with this libertarian crowd, you guys might say, yeah, that's what's fine with that one, where, you know, high crime areas have a lot of police, and then the issue is, do they have a lot of police to deal with the crime, or do they have a lot of crime because of the police? But again, with Rothbardians, you'd say it's the same thing. But um, <laughs> you, you get the thing with the hospitals, I hope, right, that uh, it's, it's not that necessarily the going into the hospital makes you sick necessarily. It's people who go into the hospital are because they're sick, all right? So it's the same thing here. It's, it's not an, it, it, you can't just naively look throughout history and say, for example, like what's the unemployment rate uh, correlated with the government deficit? Because you might find that, oh gee, government deficits go hand in hand with awful economies. But the Keynesian would say quite understandably, yeah, but, the only reason they're spending so much is because the economy was awful and they were trying to fix it. And so that's not fair. If, if, if this is a tool that governments tend to use to fix bad economies, you would see that, wouldn't you? And so the reason they like World War II so much is they're saying here the extra spending was not because the economy was awful. They were spending more for the war effort, and so it's sort of this exogenous thing. It's, it's a natural policy experiment. All right? So that's why they like this. And they come up with other ones, and they... Uh, the Freakonomics guy, he does a lot of stuff in his book about this type of thing where you want to isolate and you want to find a case where the, the two variables that you're trying to figure out, does one cause the other, the way to, you want to cleanly test that or to more cleanly test that is to find cases where the one thing goes up for something that's clearly unrelated to the other trend and then you can see if the two move together or if they go in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's why they like this, this story so much or this episode so much. Um, so what are they doing, I've, and I mentioned some of this in the previous lecture, that the problem is that one of the major problems with this treatment is they'll just naively, the, the Keynesians will naively look and say, uh-oh, GDP went way up during the 40s, so clearly government spending fixed the economy, but that assumes it makes sense to just lump in private spending and government spending and treating them as equal, that a billion dollars that consumers spend on radios and cars is the same amount of output as a billion dollars that uh, the government spends on tanks, when clearly that's not the case. And, and again, you don't need to have a libertarian theory to make that judgment call. So just in terms of standard economics, the reason it's somewhat acceptable as a first approximation to lump in all private spending in dollar terms is that you say on the margin, people could spend their dollars among competing uses. And so a billion dollars spent on radios in a billion dollars spent on cars, it's not terrible to say that's $2 billion in total output if you wanna somehow come up with a common denominator. But it really doesn't make sense to then say, oh, and a billion dollars government spends on tanks, that's $3 billion in total output. No, you, even just on mainstream economic terms, that you can't do that because the incentives facing the government expenditures are different from the ones in the private sector. Namely, if the government finds a cheaper deal with tanks that are just as effective but are 10% cheaper, they have no incentive to switch to them. 
because the money they save, then they're gonna lose it in their budget. They can't pocket it. It's not that they get more profits for their shareholders. All right, so there's no reason for government officials to be parsimonious with their money. And so the fact that they're willing to spend a billion dollars on something isn't even to a first approximation evidence that that's a billion dollars worth of output. Okay, so that's one huge objection to their, the, their whole premise of what they're doing. Uh, another main major problem, and, and this stuff, of course, is Bob Higgs is the guy who really brought this stuff to the forefront. Another major objection is to what the Keynesians do with this episode is they ignore price controls. And so what happened is the Federal Reserve was monetizing the debt during the war era, and so that's partly how the U.S. government was able to spend so much on the war effort. That's why nominal GDP was able to rise so quickly, because private creditors wouldn't have lent the government so much money on such cheap terms. What happened is the Fed was monetizing a lot of the debt. Other things equal, that would have pushed up the price level. And so when you calculate real GDP, which is what the Keynesians use, because they think they're being careful and rigorous, it's, oh, we're looking at real GDP. We're not, we're not idiots. But so the, the numerator is going up because the government's printing money and, and spending it, but the denominator, it was illegal to go up, right? You, you, it was literally illegal for prices to rise in reaction to how much new money had been printed. So it's not surprising then that that whole quotient went up, if you will, if, they, if they're allowed to print money to raise the numerator, but it's illegal for the denominator to go up and offset that. Okay, the, now this is something I didn't mention yesterday. Uh, I had an article in the American Conservative come out recently where this is a little bit, it's consistent with what Bob Higgs has been saying, but I'm, I'm trying to put it in different terms. So, suppose we forget these first two things. Let me just give that for the sake of argument and knock those out and just forget those arguments. Suppose we took Krugman and those guys at face value because they're saying we could do now what we did during the war years, World War II, because that proved the efficacy of government spending to create certain government-provided goods and services and raise total output. So what if we just looked at those statistics, took them at face value and said, oh yeah, real GDP really did go way up during the wars, and yet you really did cure unemployment by just spending a bunch of money. And so we'll look at that as a model. Is that what we should do right now? And I wanna say no, even on their own terms, nobody, if he really understood what happened during the war years, would do that. Because what actually happened is that private output fell 55% over three years. And government debt during the war increased by a factor of five. So what that would mean now is if the government were to spend as much as it did during World War II, it would so much crowd out the private sector that current living standards in terms of the private sector would go back to 1984 levels and the federal debt would be $50 trillion. And this would just happen in a, in a matter of a few years. And so Krugman and those guys, they say, oh, but, but no, we wouldn't be spending on, on socially useless things like, like tanks and bombers. We'd be having roads and schools and bridges. You say, okay, what household right now, if you said to them, okay, your private standard of living, like you, you go out to restaurants, how much you spend for gasoline, things like that, what your rent is, things that the, the market provides for you, your level of consumption right now is going to go down 55% over the next three years, and the federal debt is going to go up by a factor of five, but the roads are going to have no potholes. You want that? <laughs> or, you know, the, the bridge that you go under is going to be a little bit sturdier. You're not going to worry about it falling on you. Which, you know, that was one of the things when that one bridge collapsed, all the Keynes were saying, why don't we spend more money? There's all these make-work projects ready. Okay, so would anybody take that, that bargain? And I don't think, I mean, the, the only person who possibly would be someone who's long-term unemployed and thinks, well, at least I would have a job. But, but even then, that person's standard of living would go up, right? So if we're talking about the average household, the standard of living would go down 55%, right? So clearly what's happening is the people who had jobs, their standard of living must have gone way down. And then the people who were unemployed but now got jobs, their standard of living didn't actually go up by as much as they otherwise would have thought in order for that aggregate figure to be like that. Okay, so that's, so again, even on their own terms, if we accept that the government spending creates output dollar for dollar, the same thing as the, as the private sector does, or not even dollar for dollar, even if we take the multiplier into account and just literally look at the World War II era and take those numbers at face value, again, what they're saying is, look what we can do. If you just give us control and you follow our recommendation, 
Now, too, just like back then, we can give you an economy where we get full employment, full recovery. So uh, what about the European case now? So they're, they, they pivot, and I think rhetorically the Keynesians realized they were on not so solid footing with the U.S. The one sort of thing they kind of had in their favor was when it, it did seem like the economy was kind of turning. So initially the economy got awful when the stimulus package passed. Then things bottomed out and they started to recover and that kind of went hand in hand with when the extra federal spending really, like when the spigots were fully opened as far as the, pack, the stimulus package was concerned. But then once that spending dried up, then the economy seemed to be heading back towards a double dip. So they were, you know, that was what they were trying to argue in the terms of the U.S. experience as this was happening. Was it, see, see, you know, once spending came up, the economy, and then it, it, you could argue that either way, that it's even on Austrian terms, in terms of quarter by quarter, it's not shocking that if the federal government's spending hundreds of billions of dollars, certain indicators might show activity, and then when they cut it off, those indicators dry up. I mean, that's, I don't really have a problem one way or the other with if that's a true statement or not. But where they pivoted now is they think Europe's the place to go, because as far as the, the standard rhetoric goes, and they, they've done a great job in terms of selling their line and, and, and framing the debate, as to what's been happening in Europe. Because clearly nobody likes what's going on in Europe in terms of the economic outcomes. And so the Keynesians realize if we can paint that as a poster child for what Ron Paul wants, then we win. So first of all, what they do is they're telling us that Europe is on a quasi gold standard. Did you guys know that? <laughs> yeah, Europe's on a gold, or quasi gold standard. What's, what's quasi or pseudo among friends, right? And what they mean by that, of course, so the euro, just for those of you who don't know, is not in any way tied to any commodity money. In fact, it was never tied to a commodity money. It was a pure fiat currency introduced to replace what at the time were other fiat currencies. It is a purely technocratic invention of mainstream economists that has nothing whatsoever to do with the gold standard, and yet they're saying, this is basically showing you the problems of the gold standard. So... What do they mean? How can they possibly say that? What they mean is uh, certain countries like Spain, for example, Krugman will say, they during the housing bubble, wages got bid up in Spain to unsustainable levels. And so what needs to happen in order to restore equilibrium now is Spanish wages need to fall relative to um, output prices. Right, so the, so the Spanish workers need to earn less compared to what their, their goods are being sold for. And so he said, there's two ways that can happen. One way is to have what's called internal devaluation, meaning in nominal terms, in, in Euro terms in Spain, that product prices remain what they are and wages actually get lower in absolute terms. So workers actually see I'm getting a little smaller paycheck now than I was last year. So that's one way to do it. Or another way is they, their nominal paychecks could stay the same, but the Spanish currency could depreciate against the rest of the world's currencies, and so it makes their products cheaper, so then they can export more. And so that's another way that you could effectively reduce Spanish wages relative to the rest of the world, and therefore get the rest of the world being willing to buy their products. All right, so um, he said, but that, that can't happen right now because darn it, the Spanish don't have their own currency. They can't devalue, they're at the mercy of these Germans and the other people who are running the, the ECB, right? So that's his, that's what he's saying. And he says, that's kind of like what happened to um, the, the world in the early 1930s when everybody was tied to gold. And he was saying that various countries, the obvious textbook thing to do would be to devalue your currency. Ah, but they couldn't because they had foolishly locked in their currencies to gold at a fixed rate. And so you couldn't just willy-nilly inflate because then your gold stocks would run down. And, and then lo and behold, if you look empirically at like industrial output statistics, the countries that went off gold in the 30s, first you saw them turn around and then it, it, it lines up, there is a, a fairly decent lining up in terms of the sequence that the countries that went off gold bottomed out and then recovered, and then it was like France, which really held out to the end, has the longest, sluggish, most sluggish recovery uh, in the 30s, right? So that's, that's what Krugman means when he says Europe right now is suffering from a pseudo-gold standard. Okay, um, 
And then the other thing, of course, is he says, he's been upping the ante with his rhetoric, saying at first it was just, oh, they're trying austerity in Europe and it's not going to work. And now he's, he's built it up to, he's, he calls it, Europe has tried unprecedented austerity. And so just to show you this unprecedented austerity, uh, and in particular, he was, he was uh, pointing to like the elections in France, saying they tried austerity in France and the French people are smart, they're Alcanesians at heart and they know to get rid of these guys. And um, in, the, in the UK also, he was saying they tried austerity in the UK and it didn't work. So you can see these figures. Um, this is from uh, Veronique Roderick in here. How do you say her name? Veronique de Rouge. You know who I'm talking about? Veronique from uh, Cato. What's that? Yes. There you go. Everyone hear that? Okay. So it, this is from her analysis, and she got people were just biting her head off with this one. You know, like somebody, what did Krugman say? I don't want to misquote him because I'm such a fair guy, but he said something astounding like, at this point, any data that come from, comes from her you know is suspect or something like that, or you can't trust it. And it's like, can you imagine in a debate over European austerity, this woman had the audacity to graph the actual budgets? <laughs> I mean... Will these right wingers? Do they have no shame? You know, and and what Krugman was mad about was that she should have just been showing government consumption and investment expenditures because some of these include transfer payments, and that there's no Keynesian rationale for why those would, which is totally not true. That Krugman himself would include transfer payments earlier when he was explaining why the uh, big government saved the U.S. in 2009. You know, he was so anyway. But that's that's neither here nor there. So what's the point with this? That you can see now. I was actually surprised. I mean, Spain actually did cut it a little bit. Greece actually cut. Uh, Ireland actually cut, which isn't shown here. But the point is, a lot of these things, at at best, maybe they partially rolled back what they had increased from 2008 onwards. So, if you're an Austrian and all along you've been saying, no, no, these stimulus spending packages are bad. They're making things worse. It's it's not really a refutation of your point that if they take that poison and then cut the dosage in half and the patient still is sick, you know, the person, oh, we tried your approach and it didn't work. You know, if you're, no, what you're doing is wrong and just scaling back the wrongness of what you're doing is still a bad idea, right? So that's um, one thing to point out. The other is that what has been called austerity in Europe, a lot of it is tax increases. And no Austrian that I know of ever said before the fact, you know, when they were about to implement this stuff, that, oh, yeah, raising taxes is a good way to get out of this, this crisis, and that will make the European economies recover next quarter, and you'll see GDP go up if they hike taxes. No, no Austrian that I know have said that, and I even, um, and I was sure, like I emailed Robert Wenzel, economicpolicyjournal.com, because I was sure he had written about this, and I said, just off the top of your head, can you quickly grab me some stuff of you saying at the outset that these plans that are gonna raise taxes and all these bailouts and everything uh, aren't a good idea. Because that's the other thing too, this so-called austerity in Europe, they have been having repeated bank bailouts and they just keep upping the ante. So call it what you will. If, if Krugman wants to say, well, I, that's not what I'm for, okay, fine. But that's certainly not to be held up as the paragon of what a Ron Paulian or you know, a, a Rothbardian would have said, this is what Europe should do. They have been spending well over a trillion dollars at this point bailing out banks who bought government debt. That's, I mean, it'd be hard to come up with things that uh, an Austrian would have opposed more strongly than what they've been doing. So here's just, just an example to show you, I'm not speaking in generalities, that this really, we can go document showing people who are influenced by the Austrian school didn't think this was going to work. This is not that you know, austerity we can believe in. So uh, this is Wenzel from April 2010 saying, former chief IMF economist uh, Simon Johnson makes the astounding call for a trillion dollar bailout of the pigs. Bottom line, the Eurozone crisis is too big to be solved by bailouts without huge pain inflicted via taxation and or inflation on citizens of this planet who had nothing to do with creating the crisis. And incidentally, this Simon Johnson, the former chief IMF economist who was calling for the trillion dollar bailout is not a closet Rothbardian as far as I know, all right? So this is, we shouldn't say, ah, see, we see that somebody here who was in the Austrian tradition was calling for the ballot. No, he, that's, that's not someone that's on our team. Okay, um, all right, that's the end of this thing. Now let me, I, now when I had prepared this, I was thinking, okay, I'm going through some standard stuff here, but I don't really have this really knockdown case of 
something to, to show you guys. And then Ezra Klein, bless his heart, just came out with something, I think this was two days ago, to just to show you just really the absurdity of Keynesian prescriptions for how to solve this mess. So the name of this article is in the Washington Post. It came out on July 24th, 2010. And the, the title of it is Uncle Ben's Crazy Housing Sale. And let me just read a few excerpts. So this is Ezra Klein talking. He says, uh, there's no mystery as to why Congress is not doing more to help the economy. And he's saying because disagreements between Democrats and Republicans over the fiscal situation. Okay, da 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 but there's a real mystery as to why the Federal Reserve is not doing more to help the economy. Ben Bernanke, after all, keeps saying the central bank can do more, and if the economy gets worse, it will do more. But the economy keeps getting worse, and the Fed keeps not doing more. And then Klein has a, a chart showing what the Federal Reserve's predictions were for 2012 GDP growth, and going back to, I think, January 2010. So in other words, it, it, it keeps talking about the Fed's view of what will 2012 growth be back in early 2010, what do they think? And then just keep advancing it, and the number keeps getting lower. So as, in other words, as 2012 gets closer and closer, the Fed keeps marking down what they think growth's going to be. So it's kind of a funny chart just to show th that how bad uh, the Fed has been at forecasting, or at least what their official views are. Uh, so you, you get what Klein is saying, that Bernanke says we could do more, we have more ammunition. Uh, and incidentally, isn't it kind of funny that the way Bernanke talks, it's always about how we have more ways to shoot the economy if we had to, right? He always talks about the Fed hasn't run out of ammunition yet. You know, we can bomb the economy even more if we need to. <laughs> All right. So, um, so Klein, this is back to Klein. So some argue there's nothing more the Fed can do, but Bernanke is not one of these people. Quote, I wouldn't accept the proposition that the Fed has no more ammunition, Bernanke said in June. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. So back to Ezra Klein. So why isn't the Fed using those tools? Explanations vary. He gives various psychological reasons, constraints that people are facing. Klein says, I don't pretend to know what is truly in the heart of our top central banker, but in conversations with Fed watchers and economists, I am convinced that there is something more the Fed can do and that now is the right time for them to do it. I call it Uncle Ben's crazy housing sale. Tomorrow morning, Bernanke could walk in front of a camera and announce that the Federal Reserve intends to begin buying huge numbers of mortgage-backed securities with the simple intention of bringing the interest rate on a 30-year mortgage down to about 2.5% and holding it there for one year and one year only. The message would be clear. If you have any intention of ever buying a house, the next 12 months is the time to do it. This is Uncle Ben's crazy housing sale, and you'd be crazy to miss it. So I, he's picked the right adjective, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, so it actually gets worse, but let me stop there. Let's assume he just ended his article at that point. Um, so think about what he's doing. There's, um, there's a term for this. Maybe you guys can help me. You know, I know Tom Woods was outsourcing this. I'm, I'm drawing a blank. So clearly what would happen is anybody, by his own admission, anyone who in the next 10 years has any intention of buying a house would do it next year. So if you think about the intertemporal allocations, what would that do? All this demand for housing that otherwise would have been spread out over a decade is gonna get concentrated into one year, and then it's gonna fall off a cliff. So what, um, what happens when the demand curve goes way up, and then it whips back, price, price goes up, right? And then it goes down. So the price of housing would go like this. Is there a, what's the word for that? It's like when you're chewing gum and you go, and what is that? It's you uh, blow a ball, a bubble, right, that's what it is. So what he's proposing quite literally is we could create a massive housing bubble and that would fix things. And also, I'm gonna sound like a jerk, but it's okay, the, the cat's out of the bag. Um, that horse has left the barn. Um, this is not an ad hominem attack. Roderick's here. I think he can confirm for me. It's going to sound like I'm attacking Ezra Klein personally, but I'm actually not. I do want to point out, though, that he's 28 years old. He has a BA in political science from UCLA, and he is telling us what the 30-year mortgage rate should be down to the first decimal point. How could he possibly know that? Why shouldn't it be 2.6%? What about 2.35%? Then it would be Uncle Ben's even crazier housing sale. <laughs> Right? So, and, and I'm, I'm being quite serious. Like, how does he, how could he possibly, what about, what, you guys know Dave Ramsey, he's been telling people to get out of debt and he has these compromises where he says, okay, if you wanna buy a house, I want you to have a big down payment 
and I want you to take no more than a 15-year mortgage. Ezra has left these people out. He's been focusing on the 30-year mortgage. What the heck is your problem, Ezra? He doesn't want to help unemployed workers. Really, he should also make sure that Ben buys 15-year mortgage-backed securities to push down that interest rate, too. You see what I'm saying? He's leaving these things out. Another thing just off the top of my head, there's lots of corporate pensions right now. That's a big issue that corporate pensions are underfunded. If you take 30-year interest rates and push them way down, that will increase the underfunding, right? Because now those future liabilities are going to be have a higher present value, and the it, assets that you had are going to earn less as you're push, pushing down long-term rates. Now, Ezra doesn't mention all that. I am sure that he has an Excel spreadsheet where he has all these different things I just mentioned and has the pros and cons and has a social welfare function to balance <laughs> the benefits to unemployed workers right now getting a job against corporate pensions being underfunded 16 years out. And he must have had the pros and cons and he has it. And I'm sure it's just linked somewhere probably that we can go look at that information because he wouldn't just spout off, Bernanke should go do this without thinking about it carefully, right? He wouldn't just do that, I wouldn't think. People would be more responsible. Okay, what did I mean when I said it gets worse? S typically, Keynesians talk about what they call counter-cyclical policy, right? So you would think, okay, well, if the housing market's awful and they're saying come in and, and buy mortgage-backed securities and, and boost the housing, okay, fine. But listen to this, and this is, okay, this, let me just read it. This is a particularly good time for Uncle Ben to launch his sale because the housing market appears to be turning. More houses are being built, the price of existing homes is beginning to rise, and inventory levels are falling. A recent Wall Street Journal poll of economic forecasters found that 44% thought that housing had bottomed out, while only 3% thought the housing market had further to fall. The Fed, in other words, would be working with the economic trends rather than against them. Do, do you get what, what he's saying there? So what he's saying is we wouldn't want to make housing go up if we thought it was going to keep going down, but since now it's finally bottomed out after th three ag or four agonizing years and it's starting to go up, now's the time to jump in and take all the future demand and concentrate it in one year. <laughs> what could go wrong with that? I can't imagine, I mean, because the economy is basically just about total spending, right? So this is what I mean in terms of giving a caricature of Keynesian opinion. I mean, he is literally calling to create a housing bubble. He just isn't using that, that phrase. Um, so when Austrian, it's, it's not at all a straw man when Austrians say things like Keynesians don't have a, an idea of the intertemporal structure of production and they, all they care about is boosting spending right now and creating jobs. That is not a caricature. That is in practice what their policy proposals do. And it's not enough to say, oh, come on, this is just some pundit. This isn't uh, you know, the actual PhD economist. Ezra Klein, in an interview with Paul Krugman, within the last three or four months, we're talking, and he asked Krugman, sh should the Fed, he didn't say create a housing bubble right now, but he said words to that effect, and Krugman was like, yeah, if they could do it, it'd be fine. So I mean, it's, that is the proposal, and of course you guys probably, many of you know that back in 2002, Krugman famously said, and the thunder booms as I say this, that, uh, <laughs> Bert, that Greenspan needs to replace the NASDAQ bubble with a housing bubble. And then, and also, just the last point, I'll turn to your questions here. Uh, Krugman has been living down that statement for years, and he goes through a, a, has gone through a succession of uh, explanations for it. And it went from things like saying, that wasn't me talking, I was quoting the guy from PIMCO, which is true, but he was clearly endorsing what the guy was saying. So then saying, I wasn't giving a policy recommendation, that was just a positive statement of economic analysis. So again, you know, if, if you, Krugman was just saying this is the way to get recovery, he wasn't saying recovery would be good. Who in the world would think <laughs> that Paul Krugman was for economic recovery, right? I mean, assuming the economic depression is bad, then this follows, but we're scientists. Okay, so there's that. And then the latest one is somebody asked him, I think it was at that Spanish thing when the, you know, he debated the Spanish guy, um, somebody in the crowd asked him, what about that Krugman back in 2002 when you said uh, it would be good that he should replace the NASDAQ bubble with a housing bubble? And Krugman said, if you go and read me in context, I was clearly joking. <laughs> Do you, I mean, so he just realized, you, know, you would think if he was joking, he would have mentioned that in the past three or four years. Like, it's the first time it occurred to him to let us know, by the way, that was a joke. So, okay. Um, why don't I stop there, and we got a few minutes for questions.
Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So the question for people watching the video, what involved Estonia and there's ways that if you're a fan of true austerity and scaling back government, you could look at the Estonian story and you could certainly tell a tale that makes it look like it's good, that it looks like when they tried the stuff that everybody else was trying, things were awful. And then when they instituted reforms, things turned around. Um, I don't know enough about their, let me say this. I don't think guys like Krugman and other ones necessarily write up a blog post and are just like, I just lied through my teeth. This is awesome, but I can't get caught. I don't think that's what they're, I think a lot of them believe what they're saying because it, there are so many moving parts and it all, it is easy, especially if you're a clever guy like Krugman to uh, craft the narrative. You, you can draw on all kinds of statistics. Just to give you one quick example about uh, Estonia, what Krugman did is, um, so he was trying to, to show people that why are people touting Estonia? And he was looking at the, the drop from um, the peak down to the, the trough and saying, look at the, they're dropping, that's awful compared to other countries that were clearly more Keynesian than Estonia was. So why are we looking at that as a success story? And so then some other group came back and said, well, yeah, but that's, you're looking at the peak to the trough. That's not really fair. Look at the trough and the growth since then. And on that criteria, and Estonia's great. So Krugman comes back and called, said that that was, I can't remember the exact words, but something like a particularly stupid objection and said, I mean, can you imagine economists who would look at from the trough and the growth since then? I mean, that would be like, that would be like looking at 1933 when Roosevelt took over and looking at the growth in the few years since then and saying, go New Deal, duh. And that's exactly what Christina Romer said to explain why the Obama stimulus package would be great. And Krugman endorsed her analysis at the time. And so I said as a joke, Krugman probably wanted to call her incredibly stupid and the New York Times ombudsman said, no, you can't say that about a lady. But the point is, Krugman can just, on any particular issue, he can take a stand and say, as an economist, these are my modeling choices, and this is the way I'm going to deal with one thing or the other. And it's, there's nothing inherently objectionable, but it's that next Wednesday, when he needs all those dials to go the other way to fit his policy proposal, then he has no problem doing that. Okay, maybe one more. Yep. Uh, the, so the question is, have I read DeSoto's article on the defense of the euro? And uh, I've heard of it, but no, I, I actually haven't read it yet. So that's an easy way to answer that question. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.